Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Daryl Bayless. I'm a software engineer and I'm currently working for a company called Timet. Um, we're a fintech company offering installment solutions to companies. Um, so if you think of like department stores when they offer you uh, credit cards, you know, to help build brand loyalty. Um, we're into those kind of things. Um, we're open to partner with um, anyone who's looking to build you no know, loyalty to their brand. Um, but today, I'm going to be talking to you about something completely different than FinTech. I'm going to be talking to you about maps. Um, it's a real like, personal passion of mine, uh, map and technology, and I'm going to share that with you today. Um, so hopefully you can go away feeling inspired as well. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a brief look at the mobile mapping market as it is today and the way it might look in the future. Um, once we have an idea of how that's going to look, uh, we're going to look at some uh, coding um, and we'll look at how Google Maps for Compose works. Um, we'll also go through some best practices as well. And then finally, um, we'll leave a little bit of time for Q&A so you can ask me some questions, I can give you some answers, or if I can't give you any answers, I'll try and point you to someone who can. Um, cool, so first of all, um, let's start off with a graph. Uh, so the mobile mapping market, right now is worth $85.5 billion, and that's forecast to grow to $87.7 by 2028. So, you know, that, that's going to be a quite jump over the next few years, and it's, I'm going to use a fancy term called compounded annual growth rate of 19.83%, and basically that's compound interest, but in terms of growth. So each year, it's predicted to grow, that market's predicted to grow about 20% year on year. So, you know, that looks like really promising. Um, so what actually is driving that growth? Well, you've got the, the usual suspects, you know, you've got your food delivery apps, like your Deliveroo's, you've got your grocery delivery apps, like the Getty's, or like your Gorilla's, um, your GoPuff, um, those kind of places. And you've also got like your ride hailing apps as well. So that may be like your bolts, your Ubers, um, you know, all using maps to give you information about, hey, you know, where's my taxi? Hey, where's my delivery? Hey, you know, um, why is it went, you know, two miles away from me? You know, that kind of stuff where you get frustrated. But, you know, that's what maps can help us do. So I thought, yeah, you know, this is really cool. Uh, you know, like, we you know how maps work on most of these devices, these kinds of, um, these markets. But I wanted to try and have a little look at, you know, the wider market. You know, at some use cases that may not, you may not necessarily think of. And um, I went away, I know I did a bit of research on the internet. And, um, yeah, I came up with um, these four kinds of strands. Uh, so I'll go through these briefly to talk about what they encompass. Um, you know, how mapping works in those areas, and then we'll move on. Um, so the first one in the top left is uh, smart cities. So if you've ever heard of, you know, using sensors to try and make cities um, better in some way, whether that's to do with, you know, improving, um, you know, the air quality, um, you know, maybe you want to make, um, you know, emergency services being able to get somewhere that much quicker. Um, if you want to maybe plan how to better build buildings within a city, um, maps allow you to do this because they give you like a um, geographical understanding of how that city is laid out, or maybe even how it's laid out in the future. You know, once certain buildings have been built, buildings have been moved, you know, the landscape has changed. All these tools via maps you know, allow you to make really powerful decisions to shape entire cities. Um, Transportation, uh, so you know, uh, fleet management, traffic management. Uh, if you're, you know, say you're a business and you've got a fleet of vans, um, you know, maybe you're like Amazon and you're, you know, you've got a delivery route of like 30 drop-offs. Uh, you know, maybe you're going through a time where actually you want to try and optimize those routes that are quite regular. Uh, you know, vans these days are equipped with like GPS sensors. You know, you're able to understand where your vans are going. You know, again, you'll be able to lay that information out on a map and you'll be able to make decisions to actually optimize those routes. Uh, traffic management, again, you know, if everyone's used Google Maps or you know, an equivalent, you know, you're able to see how the traffic is in a certain area during certain times of the day. And you actually may be able to re-navigate that uh, traffic you know, to somewhere that's a little less congested. And 
yeah, um, generally help you know, ease the flow of traffic, really useful. Um, Self-driving cars as well, um, this is quite a niche one, but you know, these days where cars are becoming more and more autonomous, um, a lot of the technology also includes maps, so not only are they able to see what's in front of them via cameras and LiDAR, you've also got the ability to forward plan because these, um, these cars actually have an understanding of how the road's going to be half a mile ahead, a mile ahead, you know, maybe even two miles. Um, and finally, um, smart mobility. So um, what this area encompasses is um, if you've seen the likes of like the Lime scooters or Voy, um, Human Forest, um, now these are smart mobility options around London and other cities. Um, and there's really powerful apps out there that use not only the um, APIs that are provided by these companies, but other companies like TfL, National Rail, all for you to be able to get from point A to point B using multiple modes of transport. These are you know, quite often you know, more cost efficient. Um, it might actually be quicker for you to get there as well. So you know, really powerful apps that do that as well. Um, quite a niche field, uh, resource management. So if you're thinking of a farmer, um, maybe someone who's you know, working in like, the mining industry, even fish, fisheries, now, again, they need to try and plan how those resources are managed to make sure they're um, you know, efficiently harvested, you know, to make sure they're not over harvest as well, so you're not working the land too much, you know, you're, not, you're, not, um, you're not overfishing, you know, maybe you're breaking some sort of like legal um, rules or you know, you're going to be like, you know, causing um, you know, animals great distress. Uh, yeah, resource management helps with that. And uh, finally, environmental monitoring as well. Uh, so things like weather forecasting, wildlife conservation, you know, climate change, and even disaster management. So again, touching on about how um, emergency services can get to places you know, in the most quickest way, and that the way that's going to be you know, really helpful. Um, all, all these kind of areas are aided by maps. Um, there is one other area I want to touch upon, and um, games as well. So if everyone's played Pokemon Go, um, you know, you're wandering around the city, you know, you're trying to catch your Pokemon, you know, you're trying to beat the gym master, that kind of stuff, you know, all that's on a map, you know. I love it, you know, it's great. Um, and also um, geocaching as well. I don't know if anyone's ever played uh, geocaching. So you, you download the app, you know, you wander around the city, you know, you try and find like little messages that people have left. Um, yeah, all driven by maps, really fun, really useful. Um, yeah, so I hope that's inspired you a little bit to see how it's a good time to put data on a map. So now, um, let's, let's go do that. Let's use um, Jetpack Compose with Google Maps. Ah, it's good to keep drinking when you're speaking. Um, right, yeah, so Google Maps for Compose. Um, for those of you that don't know, it was released in February 2022. Um, and you now it brings the speed and simplicity of Jetpack Compose to Google Maps. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so, you know, Jetpack Compose, as hopefully we all know, is the new cool way of building UI for Android. Um, you know, it, it provides you know, a declarative way to drive your UI and provide a state in a really simple way compared to the old view-based um, toolkit. Um, you know, there's no XML, there's no kind of you no know, binding views. It's just, you know, write, write your code, write your layout, provide the data that drives how things should change over time, and you're done. Um, how you use um, Google Maps for Compose? Um, well, first of all, you need to create a project in the Google Cloud Console. Um, so what that involves you is going you know, on the internet, logging into your Google account, going to the, the Google Cloud website. Uh, you have to enable the Google Cloud's Maps, uh, Google Maps API. You need to generate yourself an API key. And then you have to add that API key to your Android project. Um, best practice is to constrain that API key to your, um, your app project. Because if you don't, and someone manages to get hold of that, then anyone in the world can use that API key to you know, ping um, the Google Maps um, backend, you know, and it can pretend to be you when actually it's not you. 
Um, there's also a really cool project, um, well, a plugin that's provided by Google where you can actually put your API key in your local dot properties. And then when you build your project, it will actually pull that API key into your project. So it keeps it quite simple. And um, because local dot properties doesn't get um, committed to Git, you know, it stays out of um, your, you know, your Git repo as well. Um, yeah, so once you've done that, uh, the next thing to do is to start adding your dependencies. Um, so the first one we'll need is the, um, the maps compose dependency, which implicitly will also pull in the, the old uh, Google Play Services maps dependency. The reason it does that is because you still need all the original parts of Google Maps, but the Google Maps Compose library provides composables on top of the, uh, the Google Maps implementation as well. So rather than reinvent the wheel and rebuild the entire SDK, um, the Google team have just provided like, composables that you can use and um, yeah, really useful. Um, there's also two other libraries you can use. You can use the, um, the utils library, which provides uh, handy functions like clustering. So if you want to you know, cluster markers on a map as you zoom in and out, um, we'll touch a bit more on that um, later on in the talk. Um, and you've also got the, the widgets library as well. So this provides um, little artifacts that you can add to the maps, like, um, like the, the scale bar or you know, other little parts that you know, feel quite intuitive in modern mapping. Um, we'll have a look at that later on. Um, yeah. And finally, uh, we're going to use the accompanying uh, permissions library tonight as well. Um, for, for those that aren't aware, um, accompanying is kind of Google's like laboratory, like play library, where maybe they've got like some cool ideas that they want to use in Jetpack Compose, but they want, they want to get some feedback from people. Maybe they want to tweak the API, but they're not quite sure. So usually what happens is um, the ideas will go into the accompanying library. It'll wait to see how people use it, whether people think it's good, whether people think it's bad, and then what will either happen is um, those ideas will go into the main Jetpack Compose library, or you know, they may never make it there. Um, yeah. So what we'll use that for today is to get the location permission, which is quite useful for most modern mapping technologies and applications. So yeah, we'll do that. Uh, right, so once, you, once you've set up, you've got your API key, you've created your dependencies in your project, it's time to start showing a map. So what we're doing here is uh, we're using the, the set content um, method. So whether that's in your activity or in your fragments. And um, I want to draw your attention to the, the Google map composable. Uh, it looks quite similar to most uh, composables that you should be familiar with. Um, you can provide modifiers to adjust how it looks. Um, you also have to provide something called the camera position state, which is how you tell the map to you know, where it should be you know, anchored or where it should be positioned in the world. Um, so if you look further up on that, we have the remember camera position state. Uh, remember that remember methods in Compose um, are used to store state. And the reason we have to store this state within the, um, uh, the set content is because if we try to set the position and then we have to um, um, we get like a, a re we have to recompose the screen. Um, Google Maps is going to forget that. Um, so what we have to do is no, we have to remember that. Uh, in this case, if you look inside, um, we're setting the position to um, high path, and we're also setting 10f, which is the zoom level of the map. So what we're saying is, right, we want you to remember um, the position of high path. We want to use zoom level 10, and we'll pass that into the Google Map. Uh, I'll draw you back to the Google Map Composable. So we've also got um, a slot API that works um, quite nicely. And it's here where you begin to start adding your markers, your annotations, um, things that you actually want to render onto the map. Uh, and in this case, we're rendering a, a simple marker. Um, we're passing in a marker state, which is a way for you to provide the position of the marker. And uh, we're also setting the, the title and a, a small, snippet, uh, small snippet. So when you tap on the marker, you will get this nice um, little pop up that explains what that marker is about. Uh, 
cool, so we've rented the marker, but what if we wanted to do something a bit cooler or something a bit more custom? So what, what you can do is instead of providing a marker composable, you can provide a marker info window content composable. Um, bit of a mouthful, but what it allows you to do is where you had that little window earlier for the, the, the title and the snipper, you can actually provide a custom implementation yourself. So in this case, we've still got the, um, the title and the snipper, but we provided it using two text composables. And we've also got a image composable as well, so we could provide our own images as well. Um, in this case, uh, we're just using an image that's um, hard coded into the app. But you know, you could use this from like a network request that you pull down, you know, to show the, the bitmap. You know, it could be um, anything else that you want to create. You know, it's a really flexible implementation, and um, yeah, uh, you can you can play with it. Uh, so let's do something a bit more complex. So now uh, we want to add multiple markers and uh, we're starting to you know, look at maybe more parks around London. So what we have now is we have three markers inside that slot API. You, um, we have one in Hyde Park, we have another one in Regent's Park and we also have one in Primrose Hill. Um, similar kind of setup, no, not really new or special here. No, we've set the individual lat longs. We've still got our camera position state and we're using those lat longs to provide three markers, each with a marker state and a, a position. So that's quite cool. Um, you know, we're starting to play around with the map, but what happens if we're starting to get like really complex maps where maybe we have 200 markers, 300 markers, 1,000 markers, that, um, that map's gonna get really busy. Um, your Android device isn't gonna thank you because it has to render all those markers. Um, it's gonna get really, really tricky. So what you can do is using the, the utils library that we mentioned earlier, is you can start to cluster your markers using a, um, a clustering composable. Um, there's a slight difference to this, like rather than using individual markers, you have to create a class. So if you see on the right here for um, the park item uh, class, you have to create a class, you know, provide um, make it implement the cluster item um, interface. And this interface will provide, uh, provides like four required fields. Um, the position, uh, the title, the snipper. Um, optionally, you also provide the z-index of the marker as well, but you don't have to. And what this allows you to do is it provides all the information for the, the clustering composable. So when you pass that um, data in, uh, the clustering composable will go away. It'll know exactly what markers correspond to which labels and titles, and um, it'll do all the hard work for you. So you don't need to do any kind of like custom algorithms to cluster markers together. You know, no like tricky maths. Um, uh, the clustering composable does it all for you, which is you know saves a lot of time and effort for us. Um, yeah, so. Our map's looking quite nice now. You know, we've got um, clustering capabilities. You know, we have a bit of an idea of how we can you know, set markers up. Um, but another thing that's really common for maps is using location permission. You know, maybe you want to see where you are on the map. Um, maybe you want to get some sensor data for geofences. You know, so if you walk into an area, you know, and you trigger it, you want to do some events. Uh, yeah, location permission is what you're going to need to be able to do those kind of things. Um, so using the accompanyist library, uh, we get the, um, the course and the fine um, permission. So um, for those of you who don't know, um, depending on like the, the level of detail you want in like the location points, you know, if you want something that's really, really like, you know, really high accuracy, you need to ask for the, the fine permission, fine location permission. But if you want something that's maybe a bit more like less accurate, you know, maybe you don't need to know exactly where the person is. Now you can use the course location as well. Uh, once you've created those inside your um, composable code using remember multiple permission states, um, you can check to see if you've got permission. And then if you haven't, you no, know, you can maybe show like a little label um, you see on the, on the left. Yep, you know, you, you can give a button and then you can request the permission and then um, you can get the, the Android dialogue to actually take over, and then you can handle whether your app receives permission or it doesn't. 
Uh, one thing to remember when you're using the accompanies library for this kind of stuff is even though you declare the permissions that you need here, you still need to declare them in the Android manifest. Um, the reason being is if you know, don't, um, then the Android operating system isn't going to be aware of what permissions your, um, your app uses. If you upload it to Google Play, you know, Google Play isn't going to know. And yeah, you're generally going to get um, a lot of either annoyed users or the very worst case, Google isn't going to allow your app on the store. Uh, you can also animate around the map as well. So what you have is a, um, a camera update factory um, object which you can pass into um, your camera position state. So remember, the, the position state is what we use to orient the map around the, um, you know, around the world. And um, using the, the camera update factory allows you to provide new coordinates, um, new zoom levels, and even like the duration of the animation as well. So you can, you know, you know animate to different points of interest depending on what your use case is. Um, in this case, uh, we're just animating through like the different markers around London where we've put like um, where we want to go for the uh, parks, and um, yeah, we use that with an, like a launch effect, you know, just to show like when you first load the you know, um, the composable, this is the first thing that we want to run. Uh, Street View is quite popular on Google Maps, so you know we have a composable for this as well. So what we've done here is if you um, tap on a, a marker, um, we use a, um, a street view composable. Now again, it takes a modifier, and it also takes a, um, a, a factory object as well, where you can provide the, the coordinates of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the marker as well. So what we're doing here is um, we're passing in the coordinates of Primrose Hill. So as soon as you tap on that marker, we show the street view um, composable, and you're able to you know, navigate around like you would, whether it's on, you know, on desktop or in like the mobile app in your own application, which is quite cool. You can also draw shapes. So again, uh, let's say you have like geofences set up in your app, but you wanted to visualize them on a map. Um, you can use uh, the circle composable, for instance. So you'd be able to set like the radius, the center point of that circle, how it's, you know, how it's laid out, you know, through colors. Um, there's also a few different shapes, like you could use like the, the polygon shape if you need to make something a bit more complex. You've also got polylines as well. So maybe you want to show the roof from A to B, you know, across the, like the streets of London, you could um, do that as well. But um, yeah, uh, you've got a lot of options here to be able to draw it on the map and you know, really make it your own. Um, the scale bar as well. So if any of you have noticed on like old school maps where you kind of have a legend that tells you, right, this size is 500 feet or this size is like two miles. Um, this is basically what scale bars do. Um, in the digital format, they're quite adjustable because as you're zooming in and out of the map, obviously the space that that map covers changes. So um, what you have in the, the, um, the Google Maps Composable Library is um, a widget library which provides these scale bars for you to use yourself. Uh, it currently has two options. So it has a disappearance scale bar, which you can put into your Google Map Composable um, and you can you also pass it in the, posi the camera position state. Um, this is just so it tracks and it understands what the zoom level is of the, the scale bar, well, what the zoom level is of the map, and it'll, no, um, it will automatically change you know, the values to show, right, at this zoom level, this is how much distance you were actually covered on. Um, there's also a non-disappearing variant to this as well, so if you wanted to you know, keep the scale bar on your map, like, you know, without it disappearing, um, you can do that as well. Entirely depends on your use case. Uh, yeah, so um, that's a whirlwind tour of Google Maps for Compose. Um, there's still a lot more that we, we can cover, but we won't go into it here, so I'll leave you some homework. Um, you can look into the, the Maps property object. So this allows you to set like a Find My Location button in the app. Um, you can also show like a nice little toolbar, so if you want like little um, 
artifacts on, on, on the map that you maybe want to set yourself, you can do that. Um, drawing polylines, we've already touched upon that, but that's, again, that's a really powerful tool that you can use. And um, one thing that Google Maps really pushes as well is the ability to change the map tile sets yourself. So you now maybe you want to go from like a satellite view to kind of like a hybrid view with like you no know, information on, and you can, you, know, you can do that yourself. Or if you really want to go one step further, you can use the Google Maps platform itself to create your own kinds of um, styles for you know, the tile set. You, know, you can change the colors, you can change the labels, you can change the icons, um, you can pull them into your map, and um, you can really make that map look your own beyond the usual Google style. Um, I do believe they charge for this. I could be wrong, but um, yeah, it's a, a really powerful part of Google Maps. Uh, also, other places that you can go for further information, um, the Google Maps Compose repo is open on GitHub. So if you wanted to check out the code yourself, if you wanted to reach out to contributors, if you even want to speak to like Google um, staff that are working on it, um, you, can, you can go there for help or just to, you know, just to see what's going on. Um, the Google Maps for Android website is really useful. Uh, a lot of it is geared towards the old, um, the original Google Maps SDK, but a lot of those concepts still apply to the Google Maps for Compose library. So um, it's good to have a look, you know, understand those concepts, and then you know, see how they are used in a, a Compose kind of way. Um, and finally, uh, you've got the Google Maps platform Discord channel as well. So um, there's people there asking questions, sharing knowledge. Um, you've also got um, Google Teams in there as well who are happy on hand to try and direct you to information or even put you in touch with people who can help out you know, with your questions or issues. Um, and yeah, that's, that's everything I've got for you. So um, thank you for uh, listening to me. Um, if you want to find out more about Google Maps, um, I've also written a blog post about this, so it's in written form. Um, if you can, you can go to my website, um, you can also email me, or you can reach out to me on various social networks. I'm Daryl underscore Bayless. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>